The iconic struggle between the apartheid regime of South Africa and those who resisted it illustrates the complexity experienced by young entrepreneurs during the 1980s. The regime relied on black labor to keep the economy going and the strikes that ensued showed that widespread discontent could be mobilized to disrupt the work that kept the regime in power. My name is Peace Hyde and this is my worst day on Forbes Africa TV. During apartheid, many blacks found work on white-owned mines, farms, or as servants. Drawing upon the black consciousness movement, a mass democratic movement emerged in the 1980s. Amidst the volatile backdrop, one young black entrepreneur had a dream to change the rhetoric forever. Let's take a look at who he is. Herman Mashaba is a South African entrepreneur and founder of the company Black Like Me. He came from humble beginnings to become one of South Africa's wealthiest and best known entrepreneurs. Mashaba refused to settle for a future that offered nothing. Forced to drop out of university, the determined young man fought to establish the first black owned hair care company in South Africa. Mashaba struggled every day of his life against apartheid with its demeaning laws and against his competitors to grab market share for his business. Mashaba launched Black Like Me in 1985, turning it into a multi-billion rand company and household name in South Africa. The entrepreneur recently co-authored a book called Black Like You, Today, Mashaba is an internationally recognized businessman with investments in various sectors of the South African economy, including real estate, financial services, exhibitions and events, insurance brokerage, bulletproof materials, security, fuel distribution, cleaning services, facilities management, merchandising and media planning and buying. In December 2015, Mashaba announced that he would accept a nomination to stand for Democratic Alliance candidate for mayor of the city of Johannesburg. Thank you for joining me on My Worst Day with Forbes Africa TV. My name is Peace Hyde, and today we have one of South Africa's most respected tycoons, Herman Mashaba. Welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this great opportunity to talk to you. Um, now, I'd first like to ask, um, who is Herman Mashaba? Herman Mashaba is a 56, almost to 10, 57 year old South African, born and raised uh, in a small village called Haramuz in Amanskral, Amanskral which is about 30, um, 30 k's north of Pretoria. Um, brought up uh, by a single mother and my sisters. Uh, my mother to used to work, work here in Johannesburg as a domestic worker. So you said that you were from a single parent home. What was it like growing up for you? Well, uh, quite interesting. Uh, unfortunately, I lost my, fa my father when I was two years old. So when I opened up to this world, I had no father around, including my mother, who was here in Johannesburg uh, working as a domestic worker, because when my father died, uh, the only commercial skill uh, my, fa my mother had to support the family was to uh, be in Johannesburg, look after white children and clean white homes. I uh, ended up being the one uh, being looked after by my sisters, who at the time were all still at school. But uh, it was a great journey. My mother, from time to time, would come and visit and really gave us her love and encouragement uh, to really want to really be who we wanted to be in, in our future lives. Now, from that time, you went on to become one of the biggest, most respected leading businessmen in South Africa. And this all started around the time of apartheid. What impact did that have on your entrepreneurial journey? Well, I think, you know, for me, as I was growing up, I wanted to use education as a vehicle to one day be a free human being because I've always, from early stage of my life, believed in personal freedom and actually taking personal responsibility for it. And uh, growing up, I thought education would really be the route. Unfortunately enough, the second year of my studies at the university, my education was disrupted, ending up with me abandoning it uh, second year, in the second year. 
and uh, decided um, in the process use business as a vehicle for my own personal independence. Mm -hmm. But there was a challenge for me. You can imagine uh, in South Africa, 1982, when I, think, I thought of going into business, the legislative framework was such that as a black person, we are not allowed to go into business. Mm -hmm. But then I decided uh, no longer to respect unjust laws because I think the apartheid legislation that prevented me as a black person to do whatever I wanted to do, I thought it was unfair. And I had nothing to lose. So I had to really try uh, and exploit my God-given talents and decided to go into business, bought myself a car, and started my business career as a commission sales rep, selling different products from the boot of my car until a big break came in 1983 when I sold hair care products for a company in Johannesburg, sold for them for 19 months on a commission basis. And that's when I identified this huge opportunity, black women ready to be permed. And I said, I'm not going to really do it for, for this white man. I must do it for myself. And uh, put together a group of like-minded uh, South Africans um, to join me on this journey, exciting journey including actually getting a white um, the, the man, Johan Grill, who was a production manager for this company I was selling for. And uh, Walter Dube brought in the financing. Walter was a black businessman, quite f f f f popular in uh, Mabopane. So Walter gave us the 30,000 rents to start our business. In January of 1985, managed to get us premises, 200 square meter factory in Harangua and uh, started the business with uh, my two partners and my wife uh, with that 30,000 rands loan from Walter Dube. And everything else now is history. So more than 30 years later, the business is still around, uh, doing quite well, but obviously I'm no longer personally uh, hands-on uh, hands any longer. Yes, I mean, well, if we look at your 30-year entrepreneurial journey, there's no doubt that it has been laden with very difficult experiences. But we must ask, what has been your worst day in business so far? You know, when I started my business, started in a 200 square meter factory. Within a matter of five years, managed to build my own factory, 6,000 square meters. Wow. Involved in employing hundreds of people. And I used to really be proud of uh, that facility facility that was producing good quality products going throughout Southern Africa. Coming out of the township used to personally give me such uh, satisfaction. And for some reason during the negotiations in this country, uh, just before the elections on the 27th of uh, uh, November 1993, someone decided to touch my factory, taking advantage of the lawlessness that was uh, reigning at the time in South Africa. They burnt down your entire factory. Uh, and I remember that night I left the factory just after six, I was the last one to leave. And the following day we were going to start a 24 hour shift because we were just finding it difficult to really meet the demands. Um, and uh, the following morning, I had a new shift starting at 6 o'clock in the morning to start operating 24 hours. And I got woken up around 1 that my factory was on fire. My factory was about 10, 15 minutes from my home. By the time I got there, I realized uh, this was not an accidental fire. And the reason why I, I immediately realized this is not an accidental fire, when you have an accidental fire, it has to start in one section and, and spread, but not when you have the entire 6,000 factory burning uh, at that rate. You know, obviously we have chemicals, you have bottles, plastic bottles. So really watching my factory overnight being brought down to ashes was, was really one of those difficult moments of my life. When you turned up to the site, to just see everything you had put your life into disappearing. What was going through your mind? Yeah, well, something un unexpected. And I remember actually in the morning, um, people who were supposed to have started to, uh, to start the shift started coming in about quarter to six. And instead of finding a factory intact, there was just rubble. Uh, the fire people were still there trying to extinguish whatever they could salvage, but unfortunately overall the entire facility was destroyed. But then by 10 o'clock I had to figure out, is this the end of my business career? And I refused uh, my life to be determined by other people. 
fortunate enough, I've also grown over the years. For me, saving for the future has always been part and parcel of my DNA. Mm -hmm. So, lucky enough, I had money to, within two weeks, buy uh, another new factory, uh, now in Midrand. At the time, the apartheid legislation was crumbling. As black South African, you could now buy property anywhere in the country. So the nearest uh, place and facility uh, that was available was in Midrand, which was just about 90 kilometers away from Mabupani. But there was nothing I could do. And the thing is, it happened at a very bad time of, of our industry because November, we're excessively busy because that's a time when, you know, it's summer in South Africa, or, uh, people are partying, there's weddings every weekend and so forth. And uh, that's why it was uh, almost impossible to meet their demands at the time. So, we ever thought uh, was uh, going to disrupt my thinking? Absolutely, yes, managed to disrupt me. But one thing for sure, not to determine my fate. My fate is not determined by another man. Uh, I've always pe taken personal responsibility to ensure that I drive my own life and no one is going to determine it on my behalf. Um, when you saw your factory done, I just want to take you back to that moment in time. Um, I know what was going through your mind in terms of a business perspective, but emotionally, as a human being, you've not had an easy upbringing. You've, you've struggled to get to where you are. Um, you've had a lot of things to overcome. When you're looking at that building crumbling, emotionally, how did you feel? Damn, you've got a huge responsibility. You're employing what, at over 200 people at a time or three, whatever number. And I said uh, to myself, hey, man, you've got a responsibility to those people. Uh, as much as it's your own business, but uh, the livelihood of uh, this two, 300 people is totally dependent on you. Do something. Fortunate enough, uh, as much as the physical structure is now gone in flames, but your brand is still out there. Come out with a plan to revitalize this. Come out with a plan to resuscitate this. And I really had this in my mind that I'm going to rebuild this. By 10 o'clock, I was already addressing staff to say to them, you know what, we're going to come out of this ashes. Whoever thought uh, they will destroy us, they made a terrible mistake. The Black Like Me brand is very strong out there. Yes, we must not be naive to think that we can rebuild this overnight. It's going to take us some time, but we're going to do it. I'm giving you and I'm pledging that we're going to do it. And ultimately, we managed to do it. Here is it, the business has been around for over 30 years. You were saying that you believe that it wasn't a mistake, it wasn't a chance um, fire accident. Who or what do you think, what was the reason behind the fire? Who do you think was responsible for the arson? Understandably so at the time in South Africa, the political uh, situation was very fluid. Uh, it was right in the middle of uh, those uh, negotiations for the new South Africa. And at the time, uh, uh, the criminal justice system uh, was not as effective as it should be. Uh, they had other priorities. And um, the, the factory burning down in the township, I guess for them was a small thing, but to me, was my livelihood, was the livelihood of uh, people I was employing, was the livelihood of, uh, was the future of a factory right in the heart of a township. Because I think for me, what I used to really get personal satisfaction was to see an economic activity right in the heart of a township where our people were not allowed to do business. They were seeing a business activity right in, a, in, in their backyard. And I thought uh, this was going to uh, one day ultimately result with more and more of our people in our communities going into business because people want to really see, uh, it's not a question of what people say, it's about them seeing but unfortunately, um, our people were never given that opportunity because I then ended up moving 50, 90 kilometers away from an industrial, I mean, from a township and going into uh, an industrial area. And I operated like that uh, in that facility until 2005, 
when yes. when I uh, then sold my business to my current partners and I closed down my f facility and I outsourced everything with my partners. Um, during your journey to building the biggest black owned um, business in South Africa, did you find um, in addition to that worst day that you were getting a lot of different racial um, negative responses? Was it because of your where you're from that people didn't accept your business or was you getting a lot of negative feedback in terms of your growth because it was quite an aggressive growth that you had? Well, I think uh, to what was difficult uh, to, uh, in the 80s was the state of emergency. I mean, as you're aware, the townships were burning. Uh, PW bought uh, the head of state of emergency all the time. And uh, doing business in the townships was a bit of a challenge. Um, Every time you're going to Soweto, you're going to Mamelodi, you've got to go through roadblocks road and uh, all the other dynamics. In fact, what was interesting even for me, uh, when I started my business career in South Africa uh, at the time, I still had to really carry uh, an identity document 24 hours, being expected to be signed by a white employer that I was employed. And um, because of the past laws, we had what, we, we had, uh, what was referred to as the past laws. Uh, the past law's uh, reason was to restrict uh, the movement of black people. Uh, you had to really be confined to a particular area and you had to be employed and be employed by a white employer who signs your ID, your passbook on a monthly basis that you're employed and you're employed and be expected to really be in that particular region or area. Now can you imagine for me for many years I had to live like uh, a criminal ducking and diving from the police. Um, because uh, I had no white employer to uh, give me permission to be in Bloemfontein or be in Johannesburg or be in, uh, in anywhere else in the country because I was selling products all over the country. But fortunately enough, I managed to master um, ducking and diving from the police and negotiating my ways out. And lucky enough, not a single day where I was arrested for, for past offences. I was stopped many times, but I would negotiate myself out of being arrested. Um, how was those stopping experiences? I know that you said in a previous interview that one of the biggest fears you used to feel was when you were approaching a stopping a barrier where they would stop and check you. Yes, uh, because uh, any time you land in jail uh, for being in the wrong place at the wrong time because you're not allowed to, to be in, in Johannesburg city centre, uh, coming from the, the Manskral. Uh, so, my strategy was always not to produce it because it was not legal. Yes. Uh, so always I'll avoid uh, having uh, to produce it because uh, I'd rather negotiate with them, uh, say to them I work for this particular big company around the corner that my uh, identity document, I left it in the office. Um, it was a bit tricky. And also at the same time, uh, the state of emergency with the army surrounding our townships, every time you go into a, a particular area, you are stopped, uh, ask questions where you're going and whose business it is, and always have to say, no, the business belongs to someone else and uh, I'm just employed. Because uh, how do you tell them that's your own business? It would create a t interest uh, yeah. in, in you. And, uh, but fortunate enough, you know what? We had those problems then. Will problems ever uh, not exist in the existence of mankind? Problems will be there today. We've got a, a new set of uh, um, challenges. So they were there yesterday, they're here today, and they'll still be here another 50 years. It's a question of people having the ability to navigate that there's challenges and adapt. Well, your ability to navigate one of your biggest challenges was phenomenal. Um, and I know you said that you had money that you had saved up in order to get a new factory. But what was the process that took you from that worst day to now continuing to maintain your brand, but build it on even a bigger scale? How did you manage to do that? Yeah, no, it was a huge challenge because at the time uh, when I built this factory, bought uh, a state of the art, manufacturing equipment, the type of equipment that uh, it's specifically designed. You don't just really go and buy it from, uh, from the shelf. So all that overnight was destroyed and rebuilding it again took me almost two years. And at the time, for me as a black businessman, not dependent on banks, 
using my own resources to rebuild this. It took me almost two years to go back into full production. And then in the process, you lose market share. Because one thing that you must understand, when your product is not on the shelf, consumer is not gonna wait for you. So they move on. And once you lost the consumer, will they come back? It's not that easy. So you've got to keep on fighting and reach new markets. And uh, that's precisely what happened. You seem very positive in your approach to, try, to challenges. Um, was there any point in time that you actually felt, look, I can't do this, I'm going to give up? No, I think it, it happened the day when um, I've stopped leaving. That's the only time I will stop uh, trying new things. Because one thing I've committed my life to is to even think about this weight retirement. And for as long as I work, for as long as uh, I have the health, I believe mankind is born and brought up in this world to come and work. Work for yourself now and work for other people. You have, you have children, they have their own children, and you have the community. I think uh, one thing that I dread in my life is uh, to, to be a better role model to others. That's brilliant advice. Um, there's a lot of young entrepreneurs that are listening to your story and it's showing them that it's achievable, it's possible. And um, what advice would you give to young business-minded people that are looking to be as successful as you and hopefully follow in your footsteps? I think it's important to really have the self-belief and self-reliance. When I look particularly within my community, there is this perception created by the political leadership that government is the answer to human development. And I, and I feel completely against that, feel completely against that. Government's responsibility is to create an enabling environment for all of us to really be the players. But ultimately, self-reliance for me, it's, it's really very critical. So I'm saying to the youth, be a player. Be a team player with other people, but at the end of the day, please learn to take personal responsibility for everything that happens around you. Never avoid a situation where you listen to other people and you think they're going to give you ultimate answers to your challenges. At the end of the day, whatever is going to happen to your life, answers have got to come from you. Without any doubt, you need to really be a player. You need to listen to other people. but. But the final signature, take responsibility for it. Wow. Um, now, looking at your entrepreneurial journey, I would say you've already left a very strong mark in the history books. But you have now recently um, embarked on a political career as the mayor of Johannesburg. Now, with that quest, what is the vision? What is the legacy for Herman Mashaba? What do you want to be remembered for? Well, you know, it saddens to really look at how our country, and Johannesburg in particular, is sitting with such high employment when there's so much that the city can offer. This can really be a city of golden opportunities, but it requires the leadership. It requires the leadership that's prepared to serve. Not going to the political field because you want to square out and save yourself and your family. So I've offered myself through my party to really be the change agent. This country has been great to me for over 30 years. And I believe the biggest gift that I can leave to this country is to save it. That is phenomenal. Thank you so much, Herman um, Mashaba, for an absolutely inspirational um, interview. It's been phenomenal hearing about your journey and your worst day. Thank you very much for this great opportunity. Thank you. Now, you've heard what the mogul had to say about his journey and how he overcame his worst day. But let's find out what some of his closest allies had to say about this remarkable entrepreneur. Okay, I'm Chris Bishop, the founding editor of Forbes Africa magazine. My name is Alex Dago, uh, a friend and a colleague of Hema Mashara. My, my name is Louis Mketoni. I'm um, the Executive Director of Securitas South Africa. Well, Mr. Mashaba, you know, the, I can actually spend the, the whole day, you know, 
relating to Herman Mashaba's, you know, his encounter with him. He, he, I've been his friend, you know, since uh, our youth days. I've known him for, oh, about six or seven years. Yeah, in, initially we met on a golf course and we became business associates and now we, you know, we're personal friends, we're family friends as well, yeah. So I know him at, from different angles, so to speak, yeah. I think he's a very determined person. I think he's a very humane person. He, he knows life, he's been through a lot. Herman is a non-nonsense person, very focused, highly dedicated, you know. Herman, like most people, um, have different personas, but I think for me, the most defining aspect of Herman's character is his, his, his integrity. Uh, he's probably one of the most, you know, ethical people that I know. He's never let his setbacks hold him back. I think he's fought very hard. And also, uh, one thing I always respected about him is he's come from the very bottom. It's always been a struggle. Fortune favors the bold, and this is especially true in the challenging landscape of business. When everything that can possibly go wrong does go wrong, only the brave keep pushing until the odds are back in their favor. Will you be bold when your worst day comes knocking? My name is Peace Hyde and this is my worst day on Forbes Africa TV.